This is the Camp Iron Mountain Podcast, a place to learn about U.S. military history as told through the stories of service members, military units, and supporting civilians. Join us as we work to preserve their memories for future generations. Welcome back, everyone, for part two of our interview with Lieutenant Colonel Mohammed Masakoy. In this episode, you will hear his story on how he's carved out a unique but successful career in the U.S. Army after transferring from the Navy. If you missed the first part of our interview, you can go back and listen to Mo's story about his service in the Navy in episode 15. And now, part two of Uncommon Journey. Okay, that was on Sunday before the day before Officer Basic course started. So this is when it gets awesome, right? So I show up. The formation is at five zero five hundred. I'm like, oh, I, I do not know what this looks like. Navy doesn't do anything. As a naval officer, nothing before 730. Mm -hmm. And that was like, that was hard. Unless you were, that was a hard time. Unless you were flying or something like that, nothing before 730. So, so, I so I, go, let like, me stop oh, you real quick. Sorry. I'm sorry. So, uh -huh. so you didn't have to do any kind of like Army officer candidate school or <laughs> no. transition course? Nope. No, nope. I was, oh my gosh, the, the closest, thank goodness for Fort Monroe, man. <laughs> I didn't know anything about the army. So I literally just walked into Fort Monroe. I'm like, I'm struggling y'all. What do I need to do? And this, there was this first sergeant there. He was like, oh, it's good. You stop by. So one of the most important things you need to learn, learn is hua. I'm like, what? <laughs> so hua, learn the word hua. Everything goes with hua. And I'm like, oh my God, what am I doing? <laughs> so they were at least able to help me get to Fort Leonard Wood. But yeah, for, um, I'm an O2, already been an officer for two years, showing up at Fort Leonard Wood. And my first morning, I show up there in a leather jacket, blue jeans, and some boots. <laughs> And I'm here with all oh, these, oh, all the, these the top, the top, gu the top gun uniform, huh? No, it wasn't even the top. Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just here, man. And of course, you know, you have all of these gold bars, you know, steel pressed creases and everything, locked in berets, all shaved and everything. And here comes the sergeant first class. He comes up to me. Where's your uniform? I don't have a uniform. <laughs> where Where are you coming from? United States Navy. Where's your Navy uniform? I'm not in the Navy uniform. I'm not authorized to wear it. You can just see the <laughs> gears in his brain just grinding. <laughs> and he was like, oh, where's your uniform? <laughs> so about three quarters of the day, I'm just kind of trooping around with these guys and finally made uh, – our small group leader, Major Madigal, pulls me off. He's like, okay, enough of this. Go to clothing and sales right now. <laughs> get your <laughs> uniform. They know that you're coming. Don't come back until you get a uniform. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, of course, the next day I have on my – these ladies work magic. They put me in a woodland uniform. Mm -hmm. I had some nice airborne boots on because I thought they were awesome because you could, <laughs> <laughs> I thought they were awesome, but you could polish them really nice. <laughs> and of course, as soon as I walked up, peep, one of the, one of the females in the class, Oh no, baby, you got the wrong rank on. I'm just like, I'm sorry. They're like, yeah, we're all, we're all second lieutenants here. I'm like, you're a second lieutenant. <laughs> I am a, I'm what you call a first lieutenant. <laughs> I can't, <laughs> And of course, you know, I'm sitting there. I, I got for like a good, the first six weeks, people thought I was lying because I had my whole, my entire military record on micro, on microfish. Mm -hmm. And they were just like, every day somebody would come in there like, are you sure that you are an O2 in the army? Yes. And the sergeant first class, you will come to me. You you know you go to jail <laughs> for <laughs> for impersonating a the wrong rank. And I'm like, I understand. And every time they would ask, I would show them the official record and everything. 
And the Sergeant First Class is like, look, um, just, okay, we know you're first lieutenant. Just know you're in school and nobody's going to salute you. I'm like, I'm good, man. I'm good. It's fine. I'll play the game. <laughs> but um, Army's easy. <laughs> <laughs> our, 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 because of course they were like, "Oh, welcome to chemical, uh, chemical observation course. This is the fifth most difficult school in the United States Army." Yeah, <laughs> all like, right, <laughs> all right. And I raised my hand and like, "You, Navy." And I'm like, "Yeah, okay, that's funny." I said, "Uh, this exam that we're going to take, uh, is it multiple choice or is it?" essay every exam i've ever taken in the navy from the time i was enlisted all the way to the officer was essay Mm -hmm. written long form answer you will have timed options you will have multiple options on each question i'm like okay yes you again i say yes so i i take it that um this will be a closed book exam it's like you will have access to all of your reference materials (laughs) i was like (laughs) Oh man, it blew their minds. They're like, "Hey yep. Navy, how how are you doing so well on this stuff?" I'm like, "Well, it's a book, <laughs> <laughs> and then I could tab it." <laughs> well, at least you could get the verbatim part th- right this time. Hey, <laughs> hey, didn't you have to do that? Just find the right circle to to bubble in. Oh mm-hmm. my god! <laughs> the only reason that I didn't graduate as an honorman is because um, I did not. I did not qualify my M16 first time go. Mm-hmm. And even that was some BS, but whatever. <laughs> they they were they were they were tripping out that I could do land nav so well. They were like, hey yeah. Navy, you're kind of good at this. I'm like, well, let, let's see. Am I going 240 knots? No. <laughs> um do, can I see the terrain features from the ground? Yes. So <laughs> and I, I can prepare the night before. Wonderful. And this is still a compass, right? <laughs> I think I'm going to be all right. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Back to your new Army career as an oh, Army oh, chemical officer. I say who? Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so following your, your basic course at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, where was your first duty station as a new chemical officer? Fort Riley, Kansas. The Army can't get enough. <laughs> And here's the cool part, right? I, I just finished Chemical Corps, OBC. <clears throat> I'm super excited. I'm drinking all the Army Kool-Aid. And even better, they send me to a smoke company <laughs> in, the, in, in Fort Riley. And I'm like, how lucky am I? You know, everybody else are going to logistics places, infantry places, but I get to go to a smoke company no kidding infantry no kidding um chemical pure right mm-hmm. so i show up there first lieutenant massacre reporting is ordered and the company commander's like dude we're over strength dude <laughs> i don't know what i'm gonna do with you it's like i got five lieutenants right now i've got two <laughs> two platoon leaders i think i have an xo and an assistant xo and now you come running through here so <laughs> He was like, um, my best advice is to either go across the street to the CSSB. I think they're deploying in about two weeks. <laughs> or you go back to division and get another job. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I didn't even have my family on the ground. So I wasn't going across to the CSSB. So I went back to division and the lady was like, oh, hey. She, I said, I, I think I, I think I need a job. She's like, oh, okay, well, here's some, here's some jobs that need some chemical officers. Ooh, we have the cab. I was like, what's a cab? Oh, that's aviation. I was like, what? Oh yeah, the aviation brigade is coming back. And I swear to goodness, Gabe, I was like, God, are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> so I said, fine, I'll go to the aviation brigade. So the first infantry division aviation combat aviation brigade was coming back from Germany. So and back in um, this is the summer of 2006. Only problem was they were coming back in bits and pieces. And when I say bits and pieces, I was one of like 20 people on the ground. Okay. And 
they were building this cab from scratch because they were transforming from a modular AVA, Army aviation unit to an, a combat aviation brigade. So they see me come in there. They're like, whoa, hey. So it was like four of us, four of us lieutenants. There was three aviation guys. Uh, two of them were Apache Bubba's. One of them was a UH-60 guy, and I was the chemo. So t- together, the, at the time, the Brigade XO was this crusty CW-4. <laughs> so we just – they made me the Brigade Brigade 4 just because I kept asking the right questions. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, you, you're going to be the 4. So that's how I first – ended up signing for a bunch of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so finally we started getting some adults on the ground and then they realized that I was a chemo. So you know what comes up next, right? USR. <laughs> you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this is the one time that I would need you to bleep me. Mother f- <laughs> <laughs> So they're like, well you're a chemo. You know how to do you know how to do USR. <laughs> um so True story, the last two weeks of Chemical Corp Officer Basics, guess what they're teaching you? The USR. <laughs> so they actually so, teach you guys at Levin, uh, Leonard, Leonard Wood. Wood. Yes. And here's the thing. I This was up until then, I'm a rock star in chemical stuff. And then they stopped the world to treat, teach us this. And I remember raising my hand. I'm like, this isn't chemical stuff. Well, you have to understand, historically, the chemical core has taken this responsibility to do this for the year. I'm like, this is nothing to do with chemical. If anything, <laughs> this is personnel. This is operations, training and stuff. I'm a chemical officer. They're like, they're going to still ask you to do it. <laughs> so fast forward. And here, and the good only goodness in all of this is that the time that I arrived in the army, the army was going through transitions. Mm-hmm. You know, they were going from the um, previous army set up um, to a mo- you know modular army, you know, legacy army to you know the plug and play where the division headquarters can deploy and the battalions stay back, or the battalions can deploy. They were going into the modular army at the time, and USR was moving from the old dot matrix PCA sorts to what was it? Oh, good Lord. Whatever the system was at the time. So I happened to catch everything at the ground floor. Okay. So as much as that sucked doing unit status reporting and everything for a guy just joining the army for the first time, that was a great education. That was a great education because now I'm, I'm starting to understand how the army is. The army is a raid. I understand task organizations. I understand unit compositions, you know, mm-hmm. understand, you know, pacing items and all this kind of stuff. I'm getting I'm getting all that fire hosed every month. I'm sitting in the meeting. You know what? First lieutenant gets to sit and has a routine meeting with the brigade commander one to one. Every month, you know, get to sit next to him. I'm sitting, I get to go to division every month. So, because I'm sitting in, sitting behind the um, brigade commander while he's briefing the division commander. So, even though this is a huge pain in the butt, I'm getting a first class understanding of brigade level, division level, tactical level army stuff that'll, that I need it. That's when I really started learning how to be a planner. Yeah. Because in a, they never used me as the chemical officer. I can't overemphasize. I was the brigade chemo, but they meet I was the I was the brigade unit status reporting officer. I was the brigade uh force modernization officer. And I was also the brigade rapid fielding initiative officer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I was of three and for a unit that was not only constituting itself for the first time, but would be deploying less than nine months later, all three of those things were super important. And people are like, who's in charge of this, Mo? Who's in charge of this, Mo? So all these big things that required planning, you know, the unit status report is due here. We have the brigade meeting here. It's due to division here. 
I had to do all of that kind of stuff. And uh, it helped me tremendously um, become a uh, become a long term planner. Yeah, that's fantastic. So how long did you stay in that job? You said you talked about deploying. Did you de- deploy with the brigade or did you move on to something else? Nope. Um, yeah. So this is kind of funny. This is where my chemo story and my aviation story starts to bleed together. So I, I, I'm now a captain um, and I'm working in the combat aviation brigade and everything. I come home one night. My wife's going through my stuff. And uh, she, she finds all my Navy my Navy flight gear. She says, do you want me to throw this stuff? She says, are you done doing this? I'm like, what do you mean? Are you, you don't want to be a pilot anymore? And I was like, uh, I don't, I don't even know if that's a thing for me. You know, I'm a chemo. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, like one or two days later, here comes a mill per message. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> you know, looking for aviators, you know, branch transfers and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, get out of here. <laughs> and if, if go to this website and Army Aviation had a whole website with all the requirements that I met and s- except no captains, period. <laughs> However, it asterisk. <laughs> and you look at the asterisk, some captains may be considered depending on this, that, and the other thing. You just have a different process. So, um, I went over to my three who I work for every day and he's he's Mr. Super Aviation Guy. He's he's Mr. Super Aviation Guy and everything and I walk up to him, I said, Hey, I'm thinking about doing this. Oh hell yeah, man. We'll help I will help you. I'll put in a good word for you with the brigade commander. <laughs> mm-hmm. So as a as a captain, if you're applying uh, for a branch transfer to aviation. You needed to get the division commander to sign off on it. <laughs> well, in my case, we were in the middle of a, a brigade change of command. So not only did I have to get two brigade commanders to sign off on it, but I got the division command. I had to get a division commander interview. Well, the cool thing was, is the um, executive assistant to the division commander used to be one of the brigade threes down at the aviation. So when I had my packet already put together, I just emailed Major Tui <laughs> and said, hey, mm-hmm. sir, wondered if you could, heck yeah, Mo, I could get you <laughs> on Wednesday at 430. I was like, holy crap. So that worked out OK. Um, I got a chance to interview with the division commander, and uh, that interview lasted six and a half minutes. He was already signing the recommendation. But that was that was no kidding. like. Um, August of 2007, we were deploying in September, man. Mm-hmm. So sent off the packet. I'm on the plane with the uh, combat aviation brigade one ID to Tikrit, where the, where the Northern aviation element and all that kind of stuff. And I'm the brigade chemical officers unit status report guy. And this, and this, now, is, our, this is, this Iraq, is Iraq, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, OIF and everything. And this is during the surge. So, Man, we're kicking butt, man. This is this is a great time to be alive. Um, get an email. Get an email from uh, two emails from aviation branch. An email from aviation branch, and they said, "Well, they said we have to know. We have your packet. We have to know if the chemical branch will release you if we if we pick you up." And I'm like, "Oh God." So I had to write chemo, chemical branch and like, oh God, you bet you so and so's better not mess this up. Yeah. It wrote me right back and said, heck yeah, go for it. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next thing was come to find out my packet had to go all again because I'm a captain. It had to go all the way up to the senior aviator in you know, in Army Aviation for him to bless off on it before it went to the board. So I got an email. Just a little email traffic just forwarded it saying your packet has been approved by the, you know, aviation commandant or whatever. And I, and I showed it to that crusty CW4. I'm like, hey, chief, what does this mean? He's like, oh, you're in. I'm like, but the board hasn't met. Hey, look, I'm telling you, if the four star, if the three, if the senior aviator said you're, you're good, the board is going to take you. Yeah. So long story short, um, I deployed. 
on September 7th of, two, uh, of 2007, the board met on November 9th. Um, they came out with the results the same day. I was back home before Christmas. I was only deployed for three months because I was picked up and the brigade commander was like, when are you going home? You're you're not qualified here anymore. You you need to go get your wings. Yeah. So they sent me home, got my family, PCS from Riley to uh, Fort Rucker and started flight school. What was Army Flight School like and what helicopter platform did you end up qualifying on? So uh, it was, I was a big ball of nerves, Gabe. I really <laughs> was because here I was. I was back in the I was back in aircraft again, right? But this time I'm in the front seat and I want it so badly, but so I'm stressed completely out. I'm stressed completely out. Stressed out because I want this thing so badly and I'm doing poorly at it. My dad is sick at the time and now my wife needs surgery and everything. So I actually started flight school in like uh mid April of excuse me, uh, the summer of 2008, I started flight school, but I had to take a 60 day break, a two month break. So my wife needed two surgeries and all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. So I finally started flight school for in, in earnest in September of 2008. This is when they had the bell helicopters as the trainers. I ended up with a really great instructor, Mr. H and, uh, he he got me through my jitters and everything, and I mentioned that because that that was important for me to have somebody to say, "Hey, look, you know all your ground stuff." He says, "As long as you know all your knowledge, I could teach anybody to fly." <laughs> later on, lo- later on, he would tell me how how skeptical he was that I was going <laughs> to ever learn how to fly. He says, "You were like seriously two days away from getting a a pro a progress ride because you were you were kind of scaring me, but." You're good now. <laughs> and uh, he, and because it was kind of funny, because when I finally did class up for flight school, all the, I was like the only captain in the class. Everybody else was a warrant and everybody else had a stick buddy. So yeah. it was just me and my flight, me and my uh, flight instructor, which was cool because you only get, you know, every day, everybody gets three hours. All right. So that's an hour and a half for each, each student pilot. Well, I had three hours with my instructor every day. <laughs> so I got double everything, which was <laughs> wonderful. So by the time that I finished primary, my touch on the controls was great. You know, and he showed me, he says, most students only get this many um, auto rotations, so many approaches, so many this. You have double everything. So, and after that, Flight school was a blast. Um, going through instruments, ha, that was a joke. <laughs> because <laughs> instruments and basic war fighting, base, uh, B, what was it, BWS, plus basic war fighting skills, that was stuff was easy because this is all the stuff I used to do in a darn turboprop, darn near going 250 knots. But mm-hmm. now you're in a little putt-putt going 60 knots in Alabama <laughs> I was having a blast and they thought I was a genius anyway. <laughs> um, but I realized quickly that I wanted to fly something that was, uh, that was just awesome. And uh, this, the Chinook really picked my interest. I, I remember watching it. I hadn't picked out which air- helicopter I wanted to fly. I really didn't care. I was just going to be happy to get my wings. But one day I was, I finished my, one of my primary rides and I just saw Chinook hovering at like 200 feet. And it was just all that power. If you ever stood next to a Chinook, it sounds like a train. Mm-hmm. And you could hear those engines whining. I was like, oh, I want to fly that. And it's just, it's it's like as big as a bus, but handles like a Cadillac, man. And hmm. I enjoyed it. Had a fantastic time getting through um, Chinook flight school. They're, the instructors were so chill. They wanted you to get through, unlike UH-60 in Apache land where they're still hazing you. Yeah. Um, they do this great thing at um, Chinook Flight School. The first day, all the instructors 
come in and they're all in the front. And they literally say, on behalf of the Chinook training staff, welcome to CH-47s. You've made it. And welcome to the family. That's cool. And it was like, huh, I'm going to be a pilot. <laughs> I'm going to get my wings. <laughs> and I, uh, quick aside. So that, uh, before that, about two weeks before that, um, you actually select your platform. So they bring the pilots, uh, the student pilots in the room, and they said, okay, here's the slate. We have four, uh, four uh, what's that? Four UH-60s, two Apaches, and one Chinook. And in that, in that OML, I was number five. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the guy behind me wanted Black, wanted Black Hawk. <laughs> so <laughs> when it came to me, I said, give me the big, give me the big girl. <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as I said that, no situational awareness whatsoever, this colonel, 06 Bird Colonel, says, you, Captain, come see me right after this. And I'm like, crap, <laughs> dang it. Turns out he is the DCO for the entire installation. <laughs> so right after that, I walk up to him, sir, Captain Massacre reporting his order. Sir, I just want to apologize for my inappropriate outburst. He's like, what? Oh, no, that's awesome, man. I love seeing excitement. It's like, no, man, uh, seriously, I see you're a captain. Just wanted to talk to you. Don't want you to wait to start your flight school because you're you're already kind of behind. We need to catch up. So normally between the time you select and the time you start your advanced flight training is like a two or three month wait. Mm -hmm. But he said, we got to get you in so we can get you classed up for captain's career course. And I'm like, what? Okay. And he had his aide standing next to him. He said, aide, hey, make sure you get his name. We're going to keep track of you. So as soon as you finish, as soon as you finish flight school, make sure you walk straight across the street and and get into the next captain career course class. That was yeah, so, so flipping. Go ahead. The career course was on Rucker yeah. as well. So right there, okay. right there. So I literally went from Delta Company to Alpha Company. Okay. <laughs> I, as soon as I got my wings, I walked across the street and classed up into A school. I mean, excuse me, into career course. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, can you describe some of your experiences um, during your aviation assignments? You know, how many different units you went to, the types of jobs you did? So I, I, I'm going to preempt all the awesome stuff right right off the bat. Flight school was the last time I flew, Gabe. <laughs> 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 so I... <laughs> I was selected to go to um, Alaska, mm -hmm. uh, where they have the 16th Combat Aviation Brigade up there. And as soon as I arrived, they made me the Brigade HHC Commander, okay. which is awesome. I got a command against all odds. Even my small group instructor <laughs> in career course didn't think I was going to get a command. <laughs> Showed him, I got an HHC. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was great. The problem was that uh, I assumed command in June of 2010. Um, right after that was a Pakistani flood. And they deployed all of the Chinooks <laughs> to Pakistan for five months. <laughs> so no flying for Mo. And in December of 2010, all of the personnel, the Chinook personnel redeployed but they didn't send the Chinooks back. <laughs> hmm. They sent the Chinooks to Washington because all of those folks that were gone are now being reset to do an emergency deployment to Afghanistan. Thanks. So they sent the helicopters to Washington so they could go ahead and do their day night calls because in Alaska, you can't do that during December because a it's cold and B it's dark. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty much. So they deploy. And they were, the helicopters were, I was in Alaska for just, for 22 months. I was in command for 22 months. The helicopters were gone for 21 months. Hmm. So I had two company commands. I had the HHC, and then I stood up Fox Company, 1st Battalion, 52nd Aviation Regiment. It's an air traffic services company. I got a chance to stand those up. And I had a great time. It was a good company commander but I never got a chance to fly as a, as a captain. Hmm. 
So um, I, I, can re- I can read the writing on the wall. <laughs> I need yeah. to find something else to do, especially when Branch is calling you saying, hey, Mo. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's your, your, your first name again. <laughs> there it is. You know? Hey, Mo, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> do i know nothing <laughs> oh yeah we just call the check on you see what you see what you think your career is going to look like so you're my career manager and you're asking <laughs> me about my career because at the time i had a, <laughs> these these tool bags i had an olmstead scholarship application pending mm-hmm. but i said if i don't get that i said i'm looking into vtip in the fifth in being an FA 59 and everything. Anyway, he was like, that's great because our, we certainly support you doing that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, um, So I was, uh, and it was important that I had a plan B (laughs) because uh, uh, you needed, you needed lots of flight time. And Mm -hmm. not only was I behind you know, just career wise, I was behind flight wise and yeah, I wasn't, yeah. go- I wasn't going to make that up. So, um, I, w- I actually, the first time I heard about being in the FA 59 was way back, um, way back when I was, uh, a Lieutenant and I started to realize what a bait and switch being a chemo was. <laughs> yeah. And this was back in the time where you would get those messages from the army said, Hey, you're a first lieutenant, you know, every now and then we need people to be in functional areas. So you're in that group. You better pick a functional area. You, you may or may not get selected for it. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what is this? So I started looking at the functional areas and I'm like, the strategy thing looks pretty cool. I like this because I like long-term planning. Mm-hmm. I, I know that sounds weird, but I liked because that's how I started doing well, not just the, is the U.S., our officer, my official job in principle was assistant S3, assistant brigade S3. And I found that the further ahead I stayed of the training schedule and the operational schedule, the better the plan gets. So, and when people saw me doing that, they were like, man, you're good at this. And uh, so I always kept that in my back pocket. So when it was time for me to find another job, I put in for FA-59, and I got picked up for it back in um, November of 2011. That's when I was halfway through my second company command. People were tripping out because not only did I get picked up, you know, you still get to keep your flight pay. At the time, you still got a chance to keep your flight pay. Yeah. And oh, by the way, I got accepted. To, my branch was like, congratulations, welcome to FA-59 have you been accepted to a grad school yet? I'm like, what? <laughs> They're like, we're going to send you to grad school immediately. So you need to get on your horse and start applying. And I, you know, because I'm a Navy guy, I said, well, can I apply to Naval postgraduate school? And I'm like, yeah, if you get accepted, we'll send you. I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> so that was the first application I applied for. That was the first school that accepted me. And people were looking at me like I had three horns on my head. They're like in the middle of winter in Alaska. They're like, wait, 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 <laughs> let me get this straight. You're an aviator. Yep. You got picked up for functional area 59. Yep. And right after this, you're going to Monterey, California. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and you're getting flight pay. Yep. Who are you? How did you pull this? It was like the first time people realized that this Mo guy is probably not traditional regular dude. Yeah. So, yeah, that that was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> How was your time at a uh, naval post grad? Did you did you do your functional area training before you went to Monterey, did or did you do I, after? I did it. I did it after. Okay. Um, school was. Oh man, it was. <laughs> School was awesome, man. It was, uh, it was really, it's like I, all the lessons that I had learned from training in the military, learning how to study, I became a professional student at that time. And I was like, oh, heck yeah. <laughs> so I had a blast. I immediately fell in with some army guys 
that we were we were all coming from some crappy places. One guy was coming from Fort Jackson. One guy was coming from Afghanistan, and I was coming from Alaska. So every day we're like we're like the <laughs> what is it the the dwarves off of off of uh, Lord of the Rings working down <laughs> in the coal mines, and then all of a sudden someone transports you to Rivendell with the with the elves. <laughs> We're like, what is this? There are trees. I hear dolphins in the bay. Let's go get, you know, tacos, breakfast time. It was, it was nuts. And Naval Postgraduate School, you have arrived, man. It, it is, it is full Navy, legacy Navy all the way. You know, they still have an O club there with leather and brass and everything where you have to pay to join the, the officer's mess. Hmm. The instructors were, absolutely fantastic and oh by the way i was a liberal arts major there <laughs> so they had like five different colleges there but one of them is the business school <laughs> yeah all the rest of the schools are like super technical and mine wasn't <laughs> <laughs> so uh I, I it was a good time i had a i had a blast so right after actually i finished i had to finish a month early because I was supposed to be there for 18 months. I was supposed to graduate and you know, walk across the stage in December of 2013. But I got picked up for the Chief of Naval Operations Strategic Studies Group. You know, out of 2,000 students, you know, seven NPS students get to go to the Naval War College in Rhode Island and go and do deep thinking about the future of the Navy with Navy leadership directly for the chief of Naval operations. So I leave from the Naval postgraduate school and go to the Naval war college and hang out at the CNO SSG, which was a mind blowing experience. I'm, you know, within two weeks, I'm directly briefing the chief of Naval operations on, Hey, this is what our concept team is going to do. And the chief of Naval operations, you know, the first question on his mind was, uh, you're wearing a Navy badge. You want to tell me about that? You should have just told them, hey, I, I, I wear it because I found it in the clothing sales. <laughs> I did. <laughs> it looked nice. <laughs> it looked nice. I thought it'd be cool. <laughs> so I did that. And you asked a little bit earlier. So that's, so the army, so I was actually scheduled to go to my, my, the basic strategic arts program school in January of 2014. But I, I asked the branch, I asked 59, I said, look, I have this great opportunity. If I get picked up for it, can you slide my date? And it's like, uh, they were like, yeah. <laughs> so I was supposed to be a part of the strategic studies group for, what was that, um, six months? But I only got to, I only got a chance to do five. But that was cool. I didn't yeah. care. So I literally went from the Naval War College from Rhode Island drove down to the Army War College and got my brains beat in <laughs> as a basic strategic arts program. Because now I'm seriously the smartest person you know. I just finished grad school. I just finished doing some strategic thinking in the Navy. You uh -huh. can't tell me anything. And I, I, I failed the first three writing assignments. <laughs> oh. Because the Army the army likes brevity the army likes writing that's very direct concise and to the point so academic writing and writing professionally from the army were two different things mm -hmm. so it was pretty much like like um buds except for army strategist because they they have a pretty that they're um I have a pretty high attrition rate between 10 and 15%. Oh, wow. So we lost, we lost two guys out of my class. And, and once again, I was getting ready to quit <laughs> after, <laughs> after I failed my second assignment, I'm like, screw this. And they were like, what are you talking about? No, no, no. You're one of the ones that are actually going to be a good strategist. We see it. You have very high emotional intelligence. We just need you to, learn how to write. You can write. We just need you to learn how to write as an army strategist. Mm -hmm. So they say, you can still make the decision that you want. We just think that you'd be really, really good at this job. So I stuck around, stuck it out. I obviously was not the honor man, <laughs> 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 but, 
but I made it through. And for all of this, Naval Postgraduate School, Naval War College, Army War College, what is your grand prize? <laughs> uh... First Armored Division. <laughs> <laughs> I kid you not, Gabe. Uh, who is that? Uh, the the G five when we were first there, um, Stewart. Oh, uh, 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 no, uh, uh, Colonel yeah, James. James. Colonel, I, I'm sorry. He has two last names for first, <laughs> <laughs> two first names. So I always, Colonel Colonel Stu James. Uh, Stu James. <laughs> <laughs> I walked into his office my first day, September nineteenth, two thousand fourteen, sir. Major Massacoy, Army strategist reporting. He looked at me and said, strategist, and laughed a good <laughs> laugh. I mean, a deep laugh. <laughs> and I'm like, um, I'm sorry. It's like, and he was trying to catch his breath. Do you know where you are? <laughs> like, <laughs> okay. Welcome. Welcome to not strategy. <laughs> oh, man. And uh, I, I'm I'm glad somebody gave me that cold bucket of, of reality because that's <laughs> uh, within three months of that conversation I was I was deployed to Jordan. <laughs> Generally, what were you doing that first time in Jordan? I was the they had me as the deputy plans chief in Jordan, and uh, right off the bat, um, they had me working on contingency uh, contingency planning so unlike working at first armor division when i deployed to jordan twice and even though those deployments were back to back and hell on my family professionally those deployments were awesome those deployments were money i was immediately well, oh you're the 59 great here is some big strategic stuff we need somebody to get smart on and they would send me to planning conferences, you know, sitcom planning conferences, you know, ISIS planning conferences. And my I'm really flexing that strategist muscle and everything. It was fantastic. And yeah. I would come back. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I guess. Uh, could you describe was it an army only um, oh, no. job so, you had or what was oh, it? No, no, no. So. The Army is the only branch that has, no kidding, dyed in the wool trained strategist. So, and unlike, you know, your Army division or any Army unit where, you know, 11 Bravo goes to 11 Bravo or you have branch immaterial, these joint jobs have, are joint billets and they are specific and they're looking for a skill set. So, when they said FA-59, I went into an FA-59 slot. I worked in a joint uh, joint plan shop. So I'm the, Army, I'm the Army strategic planner, but I'm working with Navy, Marine Corps, everything. It was, it was exactly what I had trained at the schoolhouse for, and it was fantastic. After coming back from Jordan, what other jobs did you have? <laughs> you talking about the first time? <laughs> <laughs> or in, in general okay. you know, uh, probably so, the second time after the second time okay oh uh, i have to put in the first time okay because the first time when i came back it was just like my head was spinning i i, I killed it in jordan but i come back and i'm nothing and nobody who are you what do you do okay yeah i'm i'm not working on iron focus <laughs> <laughs> so unless you're a maneuver guy, infantry, artillery, aviation, they didn't know what to do with me in division. So I became the division. Um, I took the worst jobs at one point. Uh, to, I, I won't call them demeaning because I'm pretty sure somebody needs to do it. But at one point they said, uh, Mo, uh, we need somebody to put some tactical graphics down for the iron focus brief tomorrow. <laughs> So it's like 8.30 at night, and I'm putting tactical graphics on on the little plastic with mm -hmm. wax wax marker. And I'll never forget, the, J, the G3 walked in and was looking, who put these tactical graphics on here? Oh, Major <laughs> Mascoy put that on there. Man, this looks like crap. <laughs> but, and of course, and you know what? They, they never changed them for four years. After I put them, they would still they would roll out that 
they would roll out the same tactical graphics for every last one of the exercise. And I would look at the handwriting. I'm like, yep, that's mine. The other job that they gave me during, between deployments was I was a prisoner escort officer. Hmm. Yes. Long story short, there's a captain that needs to go to the pokey for three years. So I literally sat through the, the most embarrassing court martial that you can ever think of. And then escort this dude from Fort Bliss to to um, Tacoma, Washington, via Atlanta. Because <laughs> that's the Delta Airlines. I did not know this. Delta Airlines is the only airline that the DOD flies all of its prisoners through. <laughs> so, but there's no connecting or direct flights from El Paso to Washington. But there is a nonstop flight from Atlanta to Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a long, long day. Anyway, and <laughs> that's what I got. It got. I, that's what I had the chance to do between deployments. Of course, I went back to Jordan once again. Now it's full blown ISIS. It's full blown ISIS now, and the planning I'm doing is just some incredible stuff. And that's mm-hmm. when I got a chance to deploy with you. You know the type of stuff we were working on. Yep. And uh, it was it was a good time. But um, professionally, though, and uh, you know you've heard me gripe about this. That was my first. In, that was my first initiation to. Yeah, you're good, but you're a center of mass. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah the the last the last eight months of your life that was fantastic, but yeah, the top block's going to go to that other guy. Yeah. And uh, when I came back to the division, uh, it was even worse because uh, that was the lowest point in my military career, believe it or not. Fall of 2016 to the summer of 2017. Um, because now I'm a division strategist and uh, the, the G5 at the time was a certified moron. And again, if you're not working iron focus, what are you working on? <laughs> uh-huh. And uh, there were a couple of run-ins where, you know, we're getting guidance from the, from the third deck, you know, with all the generals up there, but our G5 is like, you know, uh, I don't think that's what they really need. So we're, we're, this is what we're going to give them. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> Oh my God, that's, this is exactly what they're, uh, Mo, Mo, Mo. I know you're a strategist and everything, but I just need you to put the slide together. And we were just straight up taking L's. Yeah. But things started to change, oddly enough, when I'd actually put into my branch. I received orders to go to um, San Antonio, to Army North in San Antonio in the spring of 2017. And uh, at the time, my son was begging, please, Dad. I don't want to move. I want to stay here, go to school in El Paso. And I was like, shut up, boy. In the military, <laughs> we go where they tell us to go. But um, but when I realized the toll that it was going to take, because move, it's one thing to move small children. It's a completely different thing to move um, teenagers. And everything. Yeah, definitely. So uh, I, I wrote it 4187 to the branch and said, hey, if you just leave me here at Fort Bliss, I prom- you know, I'll, I'll retire in 2019 when I hit 20 years and they were like sold. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I went up to um, chief of staff. You remember Colonel Costanza, awesome guy. Mm-hmm. And I said, look, I already told my branch, I'm trying to stay. Is there any way that I don't go on this deployment? <laughs> because that will be my third deployment in three years. He's like, why don't you say something? Yeah, we'll <laughs> leave you. We'll leave you behind. You, You'll be the planner that we leave behind. And unbeknownst to me, that set me up for that. That was the turn because the entire, most of the division headquarters left and I'm the only planner that they leave back. Yeah. And I got two pep talks, both of them from general, general white, major general white at the time sat me down and said, Mo, we're going to be gone. And we're, he talks. We're going to be gone and we're going to be doing, you know, so it's two hour focus. Here's my guidance. You're going to have to plan based on my guidance. So I got a good 20 minute guidance talk from him. Roger, sir, got it. And uh, <laughs> the next 
uh, pep talk I received was uh, what was that general's name? The one that was General see, Landis. Uh, general Landis. Oh my God! So he was now <laughs> he was the rear D commander, task force tank. He brought me up because now he's my senior raider. And long story short, he was like, hey, "There's not going to be a J. There's not going to be a G five. Okay, you're going to be working future operations, and that none of that stuff you guys were doing in the G five is going to work here. Okay, it's like I I understand the previous G five he had his struggles, but I don't think it was all his fault. I think some of that was you guys. I was like, oh my god, <laughs> oh my god. So I walked into his office just wanting to just make it. You know, yeah. let me just get through this year, hide under a table somewhere. But after he said that, that he thought I, in so many words, he thought I was stupid by association. Oh, no. I walked out of his office. I'm like, I'm going to show him what I can do. Mm-hmm. So now I'm the, I'm the future operations officer for the division. I've got the con for all of the iron focuses and every training exercise that's on the installation. And Gabe killed it. <laughs> <laughs> and I killed it because of one reason. I did not approach it as a maneuverist. <laughs> yeah. You know how the maneuver guys, what do they do? They plan all of the day one the details, movement, yeah. the details and all that stuff. I'm like, okay, we're in a resource constrained in- environment. You know, the division headquarters is gone. Two of the three maneuver brigades are gone, and the combat aviation brigade is overtasked. They're, you know, the training audience for this is the one brigade that's left and the sustainment brigade. I'm like, so I told everyone, I said, we're going to have to plan this backwards. And that is, we're going to we're gonna plan the resourcing and logistics first. Oh, no, it's not the way we normally do it. You know? I'm like, hey, <laughs> we can't do it that way. We've got to plan out all yeah. this other stuff, but we got to get the range. The range is locked in and all that kind of stuff. I said, we'll get to that. Wait, 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 look, but we still don't have the scheme of maneuver. I said, we'll get to that. I promise you. So about 10 days, five days before we need the scheme of maneuver and everything, I finally, I just, I just grabbed an armor major and an armor captain and I took them down to the MTC. Uh, you remember Mr. Tony Hamish, right? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> that's another I, couple of episodes of podcast we could do. <laughs> with Tony. More episodes. <laughs> so I took this captain and this major down there. I got Tony Hammers. I set him down. I said, look, here's a division commander's guidance. I said, Tony, you've done iron focus here for at least the past 10 years. I have a major and a captain here to write the order. Mix this up. And it took him about 15 minutes to figure out what it is that I was trying to do. They're like, oh, you want us to come up with the scheme maneuver and everything? I said, yes, because you have the guidance. We have the resources. Based on the resources, plan the scheme of maneuver. You know, they had that thing together in a day and a half. Huh. All those times, you remember how you'd have majors sitting there weeks, months at a time planning the maneuver stuff. And when they finally get to the exercise, they don't have porter potties. <laughs> they don't have an out four. <laughs> And they, they they don't have food. They don't have fuel. Uh, 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 or we, enough we, tires. Or enough tires. Oh, thanks, <laughs> First Brigade. I remember that. <laughs> so, so seriously, now this stuff is – so now I'm briefing the general. Yeah, here's the scheme maneuver. The general's like, hey, this looks good. We have all the yeah, – we're good. And now – People are looking at me like the general, unbeknownst to me, General Landis is bragging about his future operations back to the general that's in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize how things had changed until you remember how the uh, the uh, the monthly training meeting, the, uh, the installation training meeting was the big meeting every month. You know, everybody in the installation was there. Right. And uh, it was December 2012. This was the it's December of, of 2017. And this is when my entire career changed. Um, General Landis opened up the meeting. He says, before we get started, you know, I want to get some feedback from the brigades. Hey, brigades, where do you, you know, how do you think the division's doing and planning and all this kind of stuff? The brigade commanders just unloaded. Uh, <laughs> be honest with you, sir, you know, your, your planners are killing us. You know, the opera orders are coming out late. It's like the, 
the brigade, we're the brigades are operating ahead of you. That's that. I, I, they're all lying. <laughs> <laughs> They're all lying. And General Landis, is li- I'm, this is the one time I've never been invited to an installation training meeting, except for this one, in December of 2017. And I'm livid. I am climbing <laughs> up the walls. I'm like, oh, my God, why are they saying this? And General Landis is like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. oh, that's a good comment. Mm-hmm. Oh, every last <laughs> one of them, 1st Brigade, 2nd Brigade, the Cav. Yeah, the division's behind us. When have you ever known a brigade to ever be ahead of the division? <laughs> Anyway, General Landis is like, you know what? That's some good points. Uh, turn to slide 37. He goes to slide 37, and it's my slide. Mm-hmm. And it shows all of the division efforts across a, 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 a nine-month timeline. They, and he says, hey, Mo, you want to get up and explain this to everybody? I'm like, what? Yeah, go ahead and show this. I'm like, sorry, I, I thought you didn't like lines of effort. He said, no, you go ahead. (laughs) I was up there for (laughs) 20 minutes showing the brigades how the division was nine months out. Mm -hmm. And General Landis just sat there swinging in his chair, looking at the, at the brigade commanders. (laughs) Like, "Mm -hmm." (laughs) and, and every now and then one of them try to, you know, sharpshoot me. Where where are you getting this information, sir? From your three. I said, all of this information up here has been sourced by your units. So all of the dates and everything are based on yours. I've just overlaid them based on efforts. Mm -hmm. So long story short, um, I spent the last four months, my last three months at 1st Armored Division as the Deputy G3. So you remember what a big deal that was to be the Deputy G3. You know, that that was post- KD job for a major. That was a pat on the back. And uh, the the Division G3 was like, Mo, I want you to be my deputy. I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> so, man, that like I said, that was when my career started changing. And I realized, okay, maybe I can do this. Maybe yeah. I, can, I can squeeze a couple more years out of this. I guess during this time in El Paso, you kind of mentioned a few of them by name already. I don't know if there were any particular leaders during this time that kind of had a lasting influence on you, or it was a couple. I won't say him. Uh, I won't say him by name. Normally, when you ask this question, you think of the great people, <laughs> mm-hmm. but I would be remiss if I didn't mention the one um, lieutenant colonel that I worked for that was a grade A moron. I, to this day, I still refer to him as the monkey. Um, <laughs> and I say that because he was everything that you don't want in a G5. The G5 it needs to be collaborative, needs to, be in, needs to integrate the staff, needs to look ahead of the staff. This guy thought that he was the uh, he was the acting G three when the G three was in the field. Mm-hmm. This guy thought that everything he came up with that the generals were going to like and it was going to be fantastic. This guy would use his rank and and his subordinates' loyalty to build products that no one wanted, and. I <laughs> watching him and he'd had success in his career. He was frocked to Lieutenant Colonel, mm-hmm. but I, I don't think he understood how to be on a major staff to act in within a staff. I think he knew how to be infantry Bubba, but he did not know how to be a staff officer. So, and I watched him struggle and I watched and both within the headquarters and deployed. And I said, well, I learned so much from not doing what he did and that was effective enough. And then my, my chief of staff, um, (laughs) air defense, former brigade commander, West Point graduate, just army through and through. And you know me, just as you've heard, my entire career was non-standard. Yeah. And I'd never gotten the, Okay, you need to you need to grow up now speech until I received my first officer evaluation rating from him and uh told me that I was one of the best staff officers he's ever worked with, but he was just concerned about my 
maturity, he says, I don't know if I can send you out to represent this command. Mm -hmm. And it was more because, you know, I can be quirky. I can be kind of (laughs) weird. I acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. But what he was looking for was for me to kind of grow and develop into that, that full package so that he sends Mo out there somewhere Folks are going to say the job got done, and oh my God, this guy, this guy Mo is the man. And I, I'm glad I got that talk. I'm glad he didn't have to do that. He could have just. What was his name again? Oh, I'm sorry. Name was uh, Mr. Forrest Smith. Okay. And it's not like we were drinking buddies or anything like that. It's just that when somebody takes the time to say you're good. I think you could be better, mm-hmm. but you're going to have to work on it and I will be watching you. And then to turn that around to it, it, it uh, my last couple of years there at JTF North, I just became a human fire extinguisher. Reflecting back on, I guess you're over 22 years of active duty service, which is still ongoing. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel? your outlook in life has changed from when you first came into the military. Um, I didn't realize how, how much development I needed. I didn't realize how, how far, let me back up. I thought I was awesome already joining Mm -hmm. the military. And one thing, you know, from experience there is in the military, especially the army army is so big there are so many rock stars. There's so many smart people and you're just another dude. (laughs) Yeah. So if you're going to do a good job, I mean, you're going to have to really put your back into it and row. And it's not, and you find it's not even so much for recognition. If you do a great job, the only way you know sometimes is that people give you more work to do. (laughs) (laughs) So I came to the military for a lot of uh, personal reasons, you know, finish my degree, you know, earn a retirement, you know, maybe become a pilot. But now I'm at the point where as soon as I pinned on lieutenant, you know how when they tell you you're promoted for your potential, Mm -hmm. you know, that really hit me when I realized that I'm no longer the young guy in the formation. (laughs) I'm the old guy. I I have great. You were hair. you were always the old guy in the formation. How about you shut your face? How about <laughs> that? <laughs> but um, no. But from an experience standpoint, like even when we worked together, I was a brand new strategist. I wasn't seasoned. Mm-hmm. You know, I was still trying things. Now, when I walk, like my next job, I'm going to the Pentagon. So I'm walking in to a job. Where they're like, we don't know who you are, but based on your resume, you should be able to do this job. Mm -hmm. And a couple of years ago, I would say, no, I can't. Now I'm like, sure, let's go. Yeah. So I feel like um, instead of saying I have an end or I'm walking in saying, let me see what I can do. Let's see how far we can go. Let's let's see what I have to offer. Because considering where I started from to where I am now is, you know, as the last two hours will attest, it's it's been a crazy, crazy path to get here. It's not very, very non-standard. That's where I've developed. And then to know that I've actually had an effect on things. Uh, the first time I deployed to Iraq, I was doing my first contingency planning. They pulled. I just. I just got off work. It was a Saturday night. And, you know, MWR, karaoke, grilled mm-hmm. food. I had just gotten on, just got the microphone, got a hot dog. I'm getting ready to chill out a little bit. And one of, a little white pickup truck pulls up. And it's a major from the my brigade headquarters saying, Mo, jump in. If something's come up, we're going to need you to plan. I'm like, now, now. And I jump in the truck. And I planned all night long. It was, you know, my day was extended yeah. for like uh, until like two o'clock in the morning. And the next day, so I'm I'm asleep during the morning. Apparently, there was an operation that was so significant 
that later that that next morning, General Petraeus came by and gave everybody a coin except for me because I was still asleep. <laughs> and everybody's like, oh, my God, Mo, you missed it. General Petraeus actually came through here. I was like, yeah, dude, whatever. <laughs> And but a week later, a week later, that major that picked me up to bring me back to work, he had a newspaper clipping and it was the effect of the operation that I had planned. And it was like USA Today or something like that. He he's he he gave me the clipping. He said, that's you. You did this. I was like, whoa. And there have been a number of things throughout my career, a number of events that when I see them happening or things are happening on TV, I say, yep, that, that's me. No one will ever know, but um, that's been a cool feeling. If you enjoyed listening to our show, please take a few moments to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player. This simple step is the best way for you to help new listeners find the show. Join us next time as we continue to share stories from America's military past.